This is a production of World Video Bible School. To God be the glory. Perhaps you've driven down the road and you've seen a sign that says, Jesus saves. Maybe you've heard it said that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. Maybe you've even heard it said that you must accept Jesus as your personal Savior. But perhaps that's as far as your knowledge goes. Friends, what must I do to be saved from my sins is truly the most important of all questions. But sadly, many people are deeply confused about the answer to this question. Some people will tell you that as long as you're basically a good person, then you'll go to heaven eternally. Others will say that, that you must say a prayer and ask Jesus to come into your heart. And still, others believe that, that you don't have to do anything at all because God is going to save everyone. Friends, the truth of the matter is the, the plan of salvation is clearly laid out in the Bible. And in fact, it's very simple. The Bible teaches for a person to be saved from his sins, he must first hear the gospel. He must hear the good news, how it is that, that God took on the form of a human being and died on the cross for our sins, how it is that He was buried and rose again and makes salvation available to the world within His church. Romans 10, 13 and 14 and also verse 17. Secondly, a person must believe that message. Once he's heard it, he must believe it. He must believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that through His death, He provides salvation to all those who obey Him. Mark 16, 15 and 16, Hebrews 5 and 9. Thirdly, a person must repent of his sins. Now, this involves sorrow for past sins and a determination in one's mind to live differently. 2 Corinthians 7, 10, Acts 17, 30. Fourth, a person must confess that which he believes. This confession is summed up in the core statement, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Romans 10, 10, Acts 8, 37. And finally, a man must be baptized in water for the forgiveness of his sins, Acts 2, 38. Romans 6, 3 and 4 teaches us that it is in the waters of baptism that we have the blood of Jesus applied to us. And though baptism is, is clearly and repeatedly taught in the New Testament as, as being necessary for salvation, the religious world is filled with those who object to it. Many who profess Christianity will agree that it's necessary to hear. They teach that it's necessary to believe. They will not argue with the need to repent. And they also agree that confession is necessary. But when baptism is mentioned, the arguments begin. Now, one of the arguments that is frequently brought up to discredit the necessity of baptism revolves around one of the thieves who was crucified next to Jesus on the cross. They will argue that baptism is not necessary because they will say the thief on the cross wasn't baptized and yet he was saved, therefore I don't have to be baptized. They will say I want to be saved like the thief on the cross. For the next several minutes we're going to talk about the thief on the cross. Who was he? What did Jesus say to him? And, and what bearing, if any, does he have on my salvation today? I want to begin by telling you the story of the thief, and then we're going to examine how this account is misunderstood and how it's misused. In Luke chapter 23, the Bible tells us that a Roman governor by the name of Pilate gave the order, and they led Jesus away to crucify him. Luke 23, 32 says, There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. Now the Gospels of Matthew and Mark call them robbers or, or thieves. And, and though we don't even know their names, they have been the topic of a great deal of discussion for the last 2,000 years. In fact, one of these thieves so distinguished himself that we refer to him as the thief on the cross. It's this thief who is often cited as a model for us to follow with regard to salvation. Now, with that said, let us delve into the story. First, let's talk about the shocking attitude of these two thieves. In John chapter 19 and verse 1, the Bible says, Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. 
Friends, a scourging was a brutal flogging with a short-handled whip. At the end of this whip, the, the thongs would have small iron balls tied on the end or, or sharp pieces of sheep's bones or, or perhaps iron chains with small weights at the end. And they were designed to, to tear into the skin and, and to cause great pain. The rule for the Romans when they were scourging a person was they were not to kill the victim but sometimes they would come close. After Jesus had been beaten until the skin on his back was shredded and bleeding, Matthew 27 tells us that Governor Pilate had a garrison of soldiers take Jesus into the praetorium. And as if the, the beating wasn't enough, the soldiers decided then that they would have some fun. And so they stripped Jesus of his clothes and, and they put a scarlet robe on his bloody, lacerated back. You see, they were dressing him like a king. They, they were going to mock him. And then they took a, a vine of thorns and they made it into a crown and they put it on his head. I, I expect that they shoved the thorns into his head. And, and then they put a reed in his hand to make him look like a king and, and they bowed before him, not, not out of honor, but, but to mock him. And the text says they bowed the knee before him and they mocked him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! Then they spit on him, and they took the reed, and they slapped him on the head. When they finished mocking him, they, they took the robe off of his bloody back, and they put his clothes back on him, and, and they put a 110-pound a rough piece of wood. History tells us approximately a 110-pound piece of wood on his lacerated back, and they forced him to carry it on the long walk up Calvary's hill. Jesus was physically exhausted. He hasn't had any sleep. He's been beaten, spat upon, severely stressed. He's losing blood, and he's hiking up the hill to Golgotha with a heavy, rough log on his back. We speculate that at that point he fell beneath the load because the text says that one of the soldiers picked a man out of the crowd, a man named Simon of Cyrene, and he said, you help him carry it. When they got to Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, they nailed his hands and his feet to the cross and they dropped it in the ground between two thieves. Now this verse is a fulfillment of Isaiah 53 and verse 12, which said that Christ would be numbered with the transgressors. Now the soldiers at the foot of the cross gambled for Jesus' clothing and then the text says that they sat down and they watched him. Over his head, they nailed a piece of wood that said, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. People who passed by blasphemed him, shaking their heads. They said, You who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Matthew says that the chief priest and the scribes and the elders all joined in the mocking. Other people said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If, if he is the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross and, and we will believe him. You think they would have? They, they said, He trusted in God, let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I am the Son of God. Friends, after this we have an absolutely amazing statement. The Bible says, Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. I want you to imagine this with me. These men who are also hanging on the crosses next to Jesus, men who are about to die, are hurling these same insults. Can, can you imagine a, an individual who was staring death in the face and engaging in such wickedness? And, and I want you to notice particularly that it says the thieves did this. Both of these two men hanging next to Jesus were participating in this blasphemy. And so on Calvary's hill there stood three crosses. Jesus in the middle with a thief on both sides. But then I want us to notice the change that takes place with one of the thieves. This is Luke 23 and verse 39. The Bible says, Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. You know the hardness of some people is truly amazing. Now I remember a story in the news from several years ago of some, some men who drug an African-American man behind their truck and, until he died. And then at the court trial, when they were being sentenced, 
they hissed at the family. It's just shocking the hardness. More recently, I've, I've seen a case of a man who appears to have purposely left his child in a closed car and, and allowed that child to die in the heat. It is absolutely incredible how hard some people have allowed themselves to become. Well, anyway, here, here is this man. He's hanging on the cross, literally just hours from death, and we don't find him sorrowing for the life that he's led that brought him to this point. We don't find him praying or, or looking for hope. Instead, we find him bad-mouthing the innocent Son of God. But, but then verse 40 tells us something very fascinating. It says, But the other, answering, rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. You see, apparently at some time during the day, the other thief had a change of heart. And you know, I think many people do. As, as they face death, they look at their lives with a soberness that they never have before. The, the reality of death can bring a proud man to his knees. If, if I may paraphrase the second thief, in essence, what he says is this, don't you have any fear of God? We, we're at the point of dying and, and look what you're doing. And, and then he adds this, he says, and we deserve it. But this man is innocent. You know, it's interesting to me that this thief knows that. He knows that Jesus is, is innocent. But then verse 42, he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. To which Jesus replied, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so there stood three crosses, the cross of rebellion, the cross of repentance, and the cross of redemption. And, and what a great statement of Jesus. Today you will be with me in paradise. What a comforting statement to a criminal who's about to die. Today you will be with me in paradise, a, a place where there will be no more pain, a place of comfort, and, and a place of bliss. And friends, that's the hope that each of us can have. Even at the end of one's life, he can truly seek salvation and obey the Lord, and, and he can find this hope. Today you will be with me in paradise. And we can rest assured that he was. I am confident that the thief on the cross, just like Lazarus of Luke 16, was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom before that day was over. All right, let's get to the heart of this study. Let's talk about the misuse of this story. The account of the thief on the cross is one of the most beautiful stories in all of the Bible but it is also one of the most badly abused stories in all of the Bible. It's, it's a story that is sometimes used to contradict the words of Jesus himself. Jesus said, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, Mark 16, 16. But sometimes people in the religious world will say, You don't have to be baptized. The thief on the cross wasn't baptized, and yet he was saved. The Apostle Peter wrote that baptism now saves us, 1 Peter 3.21. But, but they will argue, baptism does not save us. Now, what proof do they offer? The thief on the cross. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 people were saved that day and they were told, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Christ for the remission of your sins, Acts 2.38. When this passage is cited as proof that baptism is necessary for the remission of sins, we are oftentimes told, well, the thief on the cross received remission of his sins without baptism. And so the question of this thief becomes one of eternal consequence. What about the thief on the cross? Does his example teach us that baptism is not necessary for salvation? Friends, the answer to that question is absolutely no. For the next several minutes, I want us to study the thief on the cross and examine some considerations that will show the flaws in the thief argument. Number one, I want you to consider with me that there is no proof that the thief was not baptized. In fact, it's entirely possible that the thief was baptized. Now, at this point in time, Christ's baptism, the New Testament baptism, had not yet been instituted. But the baptism of John the Baptist was in effect. 
And the Bible indicates that many people were baptized under the baptism of John. Matthew 3, 1 and 2 says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now, Matthew tells us that John was preaching about the kingdom. He was preaching and baptizing. His message was about the kingdom. Luke 23, 42 tells us that the thief knew about the kingdom. Remember, he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now here's the question. If the thief knew about the kingdom that John preached, isn't it entirely possible that he also knew about the baptism that John preached? In fact, listen how Matthew continues. He tells us that John was preaching about the kingdom, and then he says, Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. And so, Who's to say that the thief wasn't among this number? Multitudes of people were being baptized. Maybe the thief was one of them. You know, when a person asserts that the thief on the cross was not baptized, I like to ask that person, what was the thief's name? Of course, he doesn't know. I like to ask the question, well, was the thief married? Again, it's unknown. What did the thief steal? Don't know the answer to that question either. Well, where was the thief from? No idea. And then, was he baptized? Friends, you see, the fact of the matter is, we don't know the answer to any of these questions. So, for the person who says the thief on the cross was not baptized, first, he can't prove that statement. And so, I can't make that argument, and it'd be a good one. Number two, the thief lived and died under the Old Testament system. The thief lived his entire life under the law of Moses. And at the point when the thief turned to Christ in repentance, Christ had not yet even given the Great Commission. You see, it was not until after Christ's resurrection that he gathered his apostles together and said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Mark 16, 15 and 16. You see, this incident with the thief on the cross is prior to that. So how could the baptism of the Great Commission possibly apply to him? And the answer is, it could not. Friends, the Bible tells us that when an individual is baptized into Christ, that he is baptized into his death. Romans 6 and verse 3. Romans 6 and verse 4 tells us that we are buried with Christ by baptism into death. And so you see, New Testament baptism could not have had any application to the thief because how could the thief have been baptized into Christ's death and buried with Christ when Christ had not yet experienced death and had not himself yet been buried? The, the, the point is this. The thief lived and died before the New Testament gospel came into effect. And so the example of the thief on the cross has no application to us today. What Christ said to the thief on the cross with regards to salvation is no more relevant to us than what he said to any other person prior to the implementation of the gospel. You know, people always say they want to be saved like the thief on the cross. Well, why not someone else? Why don't they say, I want to be saved like the rich young ruler? You know, Jesus told the rich young ruler that in order to inherit eternal life, he needed to go and sell all that he had and give to the poor. But I have never heard anyone say, I want to be saved the way Christ told the rich young ruler. But you know what? One is just as relevant as the other. Let me give you an illustration. And um, maybe this will help shed some light on this. Let's suppose that a man today says, I have decided that I am not going to pay federal income taxes because I have learned that George Washington did not pay income taxes. And he says, if George Washington, the father of our country, lived and died without paying federal income taxes, I'm not going to do it either. Well, you know, it's true that George Washington did not pay federal income tax. But the reason for that is he lived and died many years before the income tax laws ever even existed. Now, you see the illustration? President Washington's situation has no bearing on me 
because I live under a different law. And the same thing is true with regard to the thief on the cross. The plan of salvation that applies to us today had not yet gone into effect when the thief lived. Okay, number three. I want you to appreciate with me that the Bible says that Christ had the power while he was on this earth to speak a man's sins forgiven. In Mark chapter 2, Christ was in the city of Capernaum and four men came to him carrying a friend, a, a man who had the palsy. But when they arrived at the house, that there was such a crowd of people around Jesus that, that they could not get anywhere near him. And so what they did was they climbed up on the roof and, and they uncovered the roof and they made an opening, they made a hole, and, and they lowered their friend's bed down into the room where Jesus was located. Now Mark chapter 2 and verse 5 says, When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Now, when the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees heard him say that, they, they were shocked and, and they said, This man is speaking blasphemy. God is the only one who can forgive sin. Now, I want you to pay special attention to verse number 10 because Jesus says this. He says, But that you may know that the Son of Man has the power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. And the Bible says immediately he arose and took up the bed and he went in the presence of them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we never saw anything like this. But do you see what Jesus is telling the people? He tells them, I have the authority to speak this man's sins forgiven. In Luke chapter 7 and verse 48, he did it again. He said to the woman there, your sins are forgiven. In Luke chapter 23, he says to the thief, today you will be with me in paradise. But friends, I want you to notice that Jesus said he had this power while he was upon the earth. Mark 2 and verse 10, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. When Jesus was on this earth, he worked that way. He sometimes chose to speak men's sins forgiven. Friends, he doesn't work that way today. Listen to this. This is Hebrews chapter 9. I want you to listen what, what, what you conclude from this. Hebrews chapter 9, verses 16 and 17. For where there is a testament, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is in force after men are dead since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Now, what is he telling us? Well, it's telling us that prior to Christ's death, his will, his testament, had not yet gone into effect. For a testament is of no strength while the testator lives. But after Christ's death, his will, his new testament, went into effect. For a testament is of force after men are dead. So what does all of this mean? It means that before Christ's death, he could say to this woman, your sins are forgiven you. Or he could say, today you will be with me in paradise. But after his death, after his testament went into effect, the only way that a man could be saved is according to the terms of his last will and testament. Let, let me give you an illustration. Let's say that my father has a lot of money, which he does not. And, and, and while my father is living, he decides he wants to give me some of that money. Would that be okay? I'm sure that would be okay. Let, let's say that he decides that he wants to give some of his money to my brother. Would that be okay? Sure, that would be okay. Let, let's say that he decides he wants to give some of his money to a stranger on the street. Would that be okay? Yeah, that would be okay. It's his money. He can choose to do that while he's living. Now, what about after he dies? How can anyone have access to his money then? Well, it's going to be accessible only according to the terms of his will. Now, why is that? Because a testament is a force after men are dead. Now, what about today? If I want to be saved today, what do I do? Well, friends, the answer is, is not going to be found in Moses. 
The answer is not going to be found in Elijah. The answer is not found in the rich young ruler. And the answer is not even going to be found in the thief on the cross. Today, what I must do to be saved is a part of the Testament, the New Testament of Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. And if you want a person to turn to or an example to look at, the Bible has given us plenty of examples, plenty of examples of men and women who obeyed the gospel under the same law that we live under. Today, you can be saved just like the Ethiopian eunuch was saved. You can be saved just like the Jews on Pentecost were saved. You can be saved the same way as the Philippian jailer and Lydia and Paul the Apostle. And that is through obedience to the gospel of Christ. That gospel teaches that a man must hear the gospel, Romans 10, 14. He must believe it, Mark 16, 16, John 8, 24, Acts 16, 31. He must repent of his sins, Acts 17, 30, Acts 2, 38. He must confess that faith, Romans 10, 9 and 10. And he must be baptized in water for the remission of his sins, Mark 16, 15 and 16, Acts 2, 38, 1 Peter 3, 20 and 21. And then he must live faithfully for the rest of his life, and he will receive a home eternally in heaven. Revelation 2 and verse 10. If you need assistance, please contact us. We would be delighted to help you.